Welcome back all. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you guys again today. And I emailed you on Thursday about, you know, there was a slight change in our schedule. So uh, the first half of the session today is going to be a um, presentation by Josh uh, from Cornerstone. And uh, the other half is going to be uh, we're going to connect to Skype and uh, talk to someone in San, uh, San Diego. So just let me introduce Josh. Um, so he has been leading various trainings, workshops, and executive coaching sessions in the United States and internationally. Uh, he was a leadership teaching fellow at Harvard University, where he trained executives and corporations, nonprofits, and government agencies. So he's the founder of All Nations Education, an organization that empowers young adults through uh, higher education in developing countries. Um, the author of an um, intercultural dialogue curriculum, uh, he spearheads social change campaigns. He's the founder of multiple technology companies. Josh holds a master's from Harvard University and he enjoys making documentary films, uh, healthy cooking, and ancient philosophy. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome thank, you, Josh. thank you very much. Well, I'm glad to be here, everyone. Um, can we go around and share our, our name and kind of our background? And and yeah. what we're doing. <laughs> we start over here. Sure, I'm Brian. Uh, I am one of six classmates here at BU doing education media technology. I am an advisor at Northeastern University. Okay. So it's a Glad you're here. Good morning, my name is Yong, and uh, this is my first semester here in BU, and um, my major is educational media and technology. And back in Thailand, I, I taught um, general English courses for freshmen at the university. And um, I hope this course will open some new insights for me for educational leadership because I think it's going to be very crucial for the future. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> I'm Su Hui Chen. I'm from China. Uh, I'm junior year in uh, Boston University, majoring at uh, management education. Management education? Yeah. Great. Hi. My name is Lu Chu. I'm working at Impulse. It's a company that is working on software platform for international organization and academia and uh, running leadership and entrepreneurship program for international students. Okay. I'm Bridget and I'm a student here at BU doing my master's in teaching for science education. And my name is Tom, I'm an environmental consultant and I got to master an MBA in health international business school in Cambridge this year. Great, congratulations. Uh, I'm Amanda, I'm a graduate student in the TESOL program at NCT here. Fantastic. Hi, my name is Fuju. Uh, I'm a doctoral student at the final, and currently I'm a visiting pre-doc in Harvard Graduate School of Education. Okay. Yeah, that's all. And I'm working, um, in, I've been working in uh, Germany uh, for, for a project, um, so that's it. Fantastic, great. Mustafa, uh, Chong's boyfriend, I'm another associate with uh, education. I'm a software product manager, and at the same time, starting my Harvard uh, Business School Executive Education next month for okay. the PLD program. Okay, yes. So I'll talk about it, I guess. <laughs> well, some of this may be redundant. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then, and then everyone knows you, and then everyone knows Sukyang. Right. Uh, yeah, everybody knows that I'm from BU, School of Education, studying educational technology. Well, great. Um, well, it's, I'm delighted to meet everyone here, and um, I'm also delighted to be here myself. I'm going to start off by sharing my story. Um, one of the things that we uh, we teach at Harvard is uh, that sharing your story is is a leadership practice. It's a leadership art. Learning to articulate your story in a way that communicates your values, and in such a way that is relevant for your cause, and also inspires other people to join you. And so um, we all have multiple stories in our lives, but I'm going to tell a few stories from my background that focus on education, particularly global education. So I was um, born and raised in Las Vegas, um, Nevada. My father is from Iran. My mother is from the United States. My father is a Muslim. My mom's a Christian. So I sort of grew up straddling these two worlds. And I was raised mainly by my, my single mother, uh, who didn't really have much money or resources. She never went to college. Uh, but she had a lot of love, and she spoiled me with love. And uh, my, mom, my, my mom sat me down in the living room when I was in high school, and she said, Josh, no matter what you do in life, I'll support you. She said, but you need to go to college first. <laughs> she said, I don't know how you're going to get there, and I, I never went myself, but, uh, but you, need to, you need to go. 
And so I took her challenge as an opportunity to achieve my goals. And um, I eventually transferred to four different schools. I started off at a community college in, in Las Vegas. Um, and I ended up at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. And here, uh, here's my mom. Uh, and this is actually at uh, Westmont College where I went to school uh, at my graduation. And um, while I was at Westmont, I experienced something that uh, really profoundly changed my life. Um, uh, Westmont was a place where I not only had uh, professors who who were not only highly competent in their fields, I mean, they went to schools like Harvard and Oxford and Yale, all of these schools that I only saw in the movies. Um, but they also had this deep sense of faith in God. Um, and I'd never seen that combination before. Academic excellence, faith in God, and in more secular terms, faith can translate more into values and character development. So while I was at Westmont, um, my professors became mentors and very close friends. Uh, this is the president of Westmont. Uh, his name is Gail Beebe. He has been a mentor of mine. Um, he started, studied with uh, Peter Drucker at the Claremont schools. Uh, he's just one of the most impressive, one of the most humble people I know. Uh, so he, he taught me that how to incorporate my deep understanding of an interest in philosophy and theology into creating business models that create social value in the world. Um, this is my rhetoric professor, who became a very close mentor of mine. And uh, I can remember the first day of class, he sat me, or he, we're, we're, we're sitting in class, and he offers three different categories of rhetoric. He says, Plato teaches that rhetoric is about flattery. It's mere flattery, that's how he defines it. And he goes into a middle category. The middle category teaches that, uh, this is Aristotle. Aristotle teaches that Rhetoric is about finding any and all necessary means to persuade somebody, whether for good or for ill. So it's more of a neutral position. And then he says, that, then there's the third category, uh, which Quintilian art, uh, articulates, and that is uh, rhetoric is about a good person speaking well. So character is a critical part of being an effective order. Uh, and he had his own definition. I, I think I like his definition the most, which is uh, rhetoric is loving appropriately through speech. So learning how there's a purpose of education at a place like Westmont was to not only grow in wisdom, but grow in love. Love for yourself and love for humanity. And, and, and in this case, it would be love for God. Um, and I think that this kind of education is absolutely critical um, for uh, being a global citizen and for, for learning how to solve social problems around the world. This is another professor of mine. Here we are bowling, we went golfing together. Uh, he wouldn't want me to tell you this, but uh, actually I won't because there's a camera. Um, <laughs> but um, he taught me, he was my, he's the uh, chair of the English department, and he taught me that writing is about going in circles in order to get things straight. I like that paradox. This was another one of my professors. Um, he sat me down in his office uh, when I was a junior, and I had taken a few courses with him. And he said, Josh, based on the conversations that we've had over the past two years, he said, I think you should consider graduate school. And um, at that point, I had never considered graduate school. I, I, I made it to Westmont, which is a difficult school to get into after uh, transferring to four different colleges. And I said, well, where do you think I should go? And he said, I think you should go to Harvard. And I kind of chuckled a little bit, because I thought there's no way in the world that I would ever get admitted to Harvard. He said, no, no, no. He said, he, he sat back and he told me a story. He said, you know, Josh, when I was your age, um, in one week I was admitted to Harvard and Princeton and Yale, all in the same week. I thought that was so amazing. I thought that would never happen to me. Long story short, after he coached me and provided me with mentorship, a year later, in the same week, I was admitted to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, and Duke, the, the, the other school I applied to. And I don't say that to brag about myself. I say that to say that um, I never thought that I would ever go to graduate school, and I ended up at one of the best graduate schools in the world. And that's because of, of the profound mentorship that I experienced at a school like Westmont. Um, it's a small school. It caps at a uh, thousand students on campus. It's actually in one of the most affluent communities in the world. Um, Santa Barbara, uh, Montecito. Uh, Oprah is a neighbor of ours. Uh, and there's another billionaire right, right, right across the road. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a beautiful place to be. But um, but uh, this has been my experience. And while I was there, I uh, eventually traveled to 
I connected with the president of World Vision International. Does, is everyone familiar with World Vision? Yes. Yep, it's, it's actually the largest nonprofit in the world. Um, they've got over 40,000 employees worldwide, and they have a $3 billion plus um, annual budget. And the president was is an alum of Westmont and, and also um, became a mentor of mine. And so I traveled with him to Tanzania and to Kenya between my junior and my senior years at Westmont. And um, here I am in Tanzania. <clears throat> uh, we went and visited a Maasai village. And while I was there and while we were traveling, my translator um, and I began to talk. And I, I said, well, what do you want to do with your life? He said, I want to help to develop my community economically and politically, but I don't have the resources to go to college to prepare. And so I began to think about my experience at Westmont and how it radically transformed my life. And I come from a lower income family. And, uh, and he uh, got my email and we began to exchange uh, emails. And, and he started to ask me to support his education. It was much cheaper than, I mean, I was at Westmont's a $45,000 plus a year school. Um, he was asking for $5,000 a year. And I thought, that's not very much money. I don't have it, but that's not very much money. So a friend and I uh, from Ghana, uh, he actually, this is at Westmont as well, we became very close friends. We started an organization called All Nations Education. Um, before that, the organization was, it was an organization that I had started. Um, and uh, we were giving, uh, we were helping out low-income families in Santa Barbara um, during Christmas and during holidays. But we used that organization, that entity, and we turned it into All Nations Education. And after I graduated from Westmont in 2008, um, I traveled to Ghana, where um, I established uh, this program. And, and this is how it worked. I, I was sitting in the executive director's office of World Vision for Ghana. And um, my friend Jay wasn't able to make it. He had just gotten married. So I was there with our, our videographer. And we're sitting in the office. and. and and uh, the executive director he looks at me and says, so how do you envision a partnership? And I didn't really have a sophisticated plan, to be honest. And so I pulled out a piece of paper and I drew this chart. And, and this chart comes from my experience at Westmont. Um, I'm a student, so these are all nascent education scholars. They're mentored by university faculty administration and community leaders who will instill values and, and develop their character. And then in turn, they become mentors of primary and secondary school students in their communities. In, in addition to that, they also engage in community service efforts. So we've created partnerships with World Vision and other local NGOs, where they're doing community service, they're creating their own projects, so it's, it's, it has an entrepreneurial twist to it as well. They're creating their own projects in their own communities to solve problems, and we've, we've supported them in that. So the way that I look at this is, this is truly a holistic vision of education. And one thing that's been um, transformative for me has been during my time at, a, at an institution like Harvard, um, I found that character development like this does not happen intentionally. I was shocked at that. I didn't realize that that didn't happen at great institutions. And, and I think one of the major problems with that is that you have people who leave and they, they've developed the intellect, but they, have, they haven't spent much time developing the heart. And so. Um, I, I genuinely believe that the education of the 21st century needs to be an education, not only of the intellect, of course that's critical, but also of the heart. And oftentimes when we don't develop the heart, we can establish leaders in the world who don't have a value system. Um, and as a result, they're building companies that are not producing a positive effects on society, but instead they're, they're the only the number one goal is to increase the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And that can be incredibly problematic. So um, what we've been doing at Cornerstone, which is a leadership consultancy my partner and I started um, about a year and a half ago, is, um, well actually let me, let, me, let me back up for a second and just finish my story. Um, I went to Ghana and then I came straight to Harvard. I did a two-year master's and I studied theology, leadership, and business. And um, after I had finished, uh, well actually let me back up a little bit and say, um, I wanted to learn how to organize students in the United States to support students in developing countries like Frank. This is one of our students. He's, he's going to be a doctor. He's graduating this year. And I didn't really know how to do that. And this was in 2008 when Barack Obama's campaign was massively successful. He was mobilizing the masses regardless of your politics. He's very good. 
at mobilizing the masses toward a common vision. And uh, one of my friends said, well, there's a guy at the Harvard Kennedy School teaching, the, the, the guy who was the major architect of President Obama's campaign. He's teaching a class on community organizing at the Kennedy School. You should check it out. So I checked it out. I took the class. Um, I did well in the class. And I eventually, his name is Marshall Gans. I eventually became a teaching fellow um, the next year. And, and then after I graduated, I, I became a teaching fellow for a full year where um, I was working with him and other teaching fellows, um, not only in the course, the year-long course at Harvard, but also in workshops um, literally across the world. Um, I led a workshop in the Republic of Georgia uh, last summer. I think that was two summers ago. Um, lots of executive education programs. We led one at the Harvard Business School um, with the Advanced Leadership Initiative. Um, and we had some executives of multi-billion dollar companies, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to show you some of the framework that, that we have taught, uh, the leadership framework. And I think it's directly relevant to building leaders in the 21st century using this model of education. So that's kind of my overview story, and, and that led to starting Cornerstone Leadership Consulting. And at Cornerstone, one of the major things that we're focusing on is, um, is establishing and discovering values. One thing that's been sort of shocking to me is that um, as I uh, coach and meet with different executives of different companies and organizations, when you ask them the question, what are your values, they don't understand the question. And that's been a really profound insight for me, um, somebody who loves to study philosophy and theology, that, that's sort of a norm. Moral reasoning is a norm from the world that I come from, and from a place like Westmont. But moral reasoning and understanding uh, your values in, in the corporate world is something that is foreign, something people don't do. It's too touchy-feely. And so um, what we're in the process of doing right now, uh, well, actually, what I'm in the process of doing right now is developing a curriculum that enables um, executives of companies and organizations to establish a one-page summary of their values. And they hang that on their wall in their office, and they carry that with them. So it's a summary of their values. So if somebody asks, what are your values? They can clearly articulate them, and they pit their values against what they're doing on a daily basis, not only in managing staff, but in the products that they create in the world. Another curriculum that I'm developing right now is on uh, values-based social, uh, values-based entrepreneurship. So we're helping entrepreneurs establish their values, and then their companies, uh, we're helping them to establish a business plan and innovate companies, and their companies are an expression of their values. <coughs> But it has to start with the values rather than starting with money. And so it's been really profound to see people create companies. And there's a company that I started um, called Dine and Feed using this model um, where every time you dine out, uh, you feed people in need around the world. It's not a nonprofit. It's a for-profit entity. We want to make a lot of money in it. But we also want to feed a lot of people. And so that's sort of the model is understanding your values. And for me, my values come from my faith tradition. I identify as a Christian. And, and when I read the teachings of Jesus, Jesus teaches you need to take care of the poor. And so I take care of the poor. It's part of my value system. Some people may get their values from other religious traditions. My dad gets his values from Islam. Some people may not believe in a, in a higher power. They may get their value system from, uh, it may be from their parents. It may be from their upbringing. Um, so we spend time helping people to understand where their values come from, regardless of where they may be. And then we help them to express those values not only in the workplace, but in the products and the companies that they're building. So that's, I want to kind of take a break here for a second and say that's, that's my story, that's my background, that's why I do what I do, and, uh, and then we'll kind of transition into leadership. And, and this will be more of a discussion rather than my talking at you. So when, when, you, when you think of leadership, what comes to your mind? What is leadership? Do we have a, a whiteboard? Or? Yeah. Um just behind this? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know what? I think that's okay. That's okay. Because we're going to need this, so that, that's fine. Um, what are some poor characteristics of, of leadership? Or what are some characteristics, characteristics of poor leadership that you've observed, that you've participated in in organizations? Disorganized. Disorganized? Okay. What else? Narrow minded. Narrow minded? Okay, good. What else? Absent minded. Absent minded? <laughs> <laughs> Pessimistic. Pessimistic? All right. Self selfish. 
Selfish. Okay. All right. Monarchy. Okay, very good. Very good. Good. What else? Discouraging. Discouraging. Okay. Good. What do you think motivates people to be these kinds of leaders? To have the characteristics of these kinds of leaders? Why are people discouraging and disempowering and pessimistic? What? Why is that? Power. Okay. Say more. I guess because their their idea of getting to the leadership position is a state of power, not really a state of leadership. Okay. All right. Say more about the distinction: power or leadership. Power just gives you extra control, gives you extra resources to have that control. Kind of allows you to take on your own initiative as opposed to necessarily forming a collective initiative. Okay. So you just use your seat of power as a, as that. Okay. Great. Great. So, so why do people want power as opposed to leadership? Based on what he just said. What's your name, by the way? Caleb. Caleb. Good to have you here. Why do people want power as opposed to leadership? They want control, change. Okay, control, change. All right. So, why, why, why do they want control? Why do they want control? Too right. philosophical. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's power <laughs> related to like a human instinct. Okay. To hold power. Okay. To dominate others. Well, let's go deeper here. Let's get, let's get philosophical. Yeah. <laughs> I have an opinion. They want control because they don't have control. Okay. All right. They want control because they don't have control. That's yeah. Cool. Well, okay. This but but to but. The disorganization. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? This speaks to the disorganization. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So mental. No, because they they probably haven't. They probably don't experience love in their life in one way or another. There you go. Okay. All right. All right. You a lot too fast. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are driven by fear, you know, and when you, yeah. what happens when you're driven by fear? How does that affect your actions? You don't know what to do. You don't or know you, what to do. You're reacting as, a, as opposed to responding. Okay. All right. You might be oppressing people maybe around you because you don't know what to do, how to deal. Okay. With the situation uncertainty, for example? Absolutely. That's a great, great point. And that's actually going to lead us right into the next point. Uncertainty. <laughs> so say, say more about uncertainty. This is good. Let's, let's talk about uncertainty. How do, how, do, how do you deal with uncertainty? If you don't want to talk about yourself, that's good. How do other people deal with uncertainty in positive and negative ways? React too quickly. React too quickly. Okay. Selfish. Selfish. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll add a positive one. I'll yeah. Try to collaborate with the other because I don't know how to do it. So okay. Ask okay. Everybody to okay. help me out. Okay. That's good. That's the positive one. That's good. I don't know if it's a positive or negative, but just keep doing it with both. <laughs> keep keep doing what? Keep keep just keep going. Just keep going. Just, yeah. just making it happen. Yeah. Moving forward no matter what. Right. That's good. That's good. Right. So so as we can see people kind of practice these, these models of leadership that we've articulated because of the inner trace, inner qualities. And a lot of people, i found, they don't spend time developing the heart and the inner qualities of life, and they're expected to go into these great leadership positions, and, and, they, and they react rather than respond, they act out of fear, they're, they're discouraging, and all these things. I think people who, who understand what's going on inwardly can express a better, a better outward life. So let's, let's talk about this concept of uncertainty. The way that leadership is defined, and this comes from Marshall Gans of the Kennedy School, is leadership is taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose in the face of uncertainty. We actually saw that sentence last week. Just, just oh, really? Know. Yeah. Well, where? Uh, we, we're talking about leadership a little bit. Yeah. Use that sentence. Use that sentence, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, Samuel. 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 Yeah, Samuel. 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 Odama. Odama. Okay. You probably saw it, Marshall Gantt. Okay, yes. Yeah. You said that, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. This, this is, comes straight from Marshall Gantt, right. yes. Um, so he, Marshall Gantt breaks this down into, into four different categories. So the first one is taking responsibility. What does it mean to take responsibility as a leader? And why is that important? Owning up to your job. Okay, owning up to your job, okay. Because nobody takes responsibility. No, okay. So somebody got to take responsibility. So how many of you in this room consider yourselves to be leaders? 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we got maybe, kind of, sorta, definitely. We have some people who don't raise their hands, right? So certain people have chosen to take responsibility. Certain people have kind of, sorta, chosen to take responsibility, and others have chosen not to take responsibility. And so this model teaches that everyone is a leader in some way or another. There are institutional leaders where people merely have a leadership role because of their title. And then there are informal leaders, people who have leadership roles simply because of who they are. And so this model is teaching that everyone has the capacity to take responsibility. It's up to you as an individual whether you're going to do that or not. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Take responsibility for enabling others. This was a huge paradigm shift. Why is leadership about enabling others? Why is, what does that mean and why is that important? Who's going to change? What's Making that? something change. Making something change? Okay. So in order to change something, you actually need to involve other people. But also, I understand it as a positive, not like to damage people or do something selfish. I get and a couple of people get. But yes. also, it should, be a, it should have a, a wider impact, yes. positive impact. Absolutely. That's good. So it's, it's, a view of, it's a view of abundance. Yeah, I don't think that was also a leader. What's that? Oh yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Um, what else? Why is enabling others so critical? It's it's allowing others ownership. Mm. You know, it's mm. not it's not you taking sole ownership. It's mm. allowing others to take ownership of what they're doing. So it, it really enables creativity and you know a myriad of ways to approach things rather than just one way. So what what does it take to be a leader who who allows other people to take responsibility. I think it takes trust. <laughs> right, there you go. And that's sort of the opposite of control, Yeah. as we've been talking about. It's the opposite of fear. Yes. Mm. Fear and trust can't coexist. Mm -hmm. There you go. There we go. Now we're getting philosophical. All right. <laughs> Glad I could contribute. No, this is good. This is good. This is good. So taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose in the face of uncertainty. Martin Luther King teaches that Power is the ability to achieve purpose. When you can enable lots of people to come together and to achieve shared common purpose, that's power. And you can't do that without first taking responsibility for enabling others. For enabling a team that then enables other teams, that then enable other teams to achieve shared common vision and purpose. I mean, think, think of the civil rights movement. That's what they did. Um, the Montgomery bus boycott. That's what they did. We can go into more detail on that in a minute. Um, but one, you know, one bus fare didn't do much. But if you aggregate all of the city's bus fare, it's going to achieve and sh achieve shared purpose through that. That's going to achieve change. So that's the idea here. Take responsibility for enabling others, whether it's teams and ultimately the masses, to achieve purpose in the face of uncertainty. I would, like to yes. add, I would like to add just two things for people that don't know. Yeah. First, uh, it's important that you bring up Martin Luther King. Well, we're at underline for who doesn't know. Martin Luther King got a degree here. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. And, um, what, 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 what? I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course. <laughs> and also behind Martin Luther King, <laughs> if anybody of you have not seen yet the speech of Obama, I don't know how many of you have seen the speech of Obama, the last one, of three, four days ago? Did you guys saw it? On the Watch election it day? online? Yeah, for the election day. Yeah, yeah I mean, speech. I Everybody? Was it the one when he, was, when he was crying yeah. or not? No, no, no. The one of crying is uh, with the staff. Yeah, exactly. the, the, the big one when he won. Oh, yeah, yeah. At, the, at the end, it was yes. one o'clock tonight. Oh, yeah. So if you can take it and break it down in pieces, there are a lot of components of Martin Luther King's message. In fact, if Absolutely. you can see him talking and see Martin Luther King's speech, that there are a lot of similarities. And this idea of bringing the buses together, bringing the masses together, so it's, it's a concept that is behind also the, the actual political campaign. That's exactly and right. you're bringing back also the idea of revolution, because exactly that right. is the, the, the actual the concept behind all these political campaigns, how to build a revolution to change the world. That's exactly That's right. right. It's exactly right. Yeah, so. It's exactly right. And started here, the you. I want to give you his power. Start the here, guys. That, that's good. That's good. And let me back up and say that who, who is Martin Luther King influenced by? Thanks. Does anyone know? 
Sorry, uh, say it again. Who, who is Martin Luther King influenced by um, to uh, create the civil rights movement? Nonviolent resistance, in particular. Gandhi. Gandhi. Oh yeah. Yeah, right. So Gandhi did that in the independence movement in India, mm. and he learned about um, Gandhi actually at uh, Morehouse College uh, before he came here, which is a liberal, liberal arts college that instills characters, mm -hmm. character and values, right? And um, and then as as Lucho said. Martin Luther King came to BU and he studied theology. And, and he was one of the greatest leaders in, in the 20th century in the United States. And, um, and I would argue even globally. Um, and he had a deep philosophical understanding, not only of who he was, but he had a philosophical and values-based vision of the way that the world ought to be. So there's, there's this distinction between the way that the world is versus the way that the world ought to be. And nine times out of ten, there's typically conflict between those two. And that conflict creates urgency. And if you can clearly articulate the world as it is versus the world as it ought to be, that creates urgency and that can inspire other people to act. And we do that through one of the leadership practices that I'm going to share with you, which is sharing story. Story of self, who am I? Story of us, who are my people? Story of now. Given who I am, given what my values are, given who we are, given who, what our values are, this is what I'm calling you all to do now. Boom. And that vision is rooted in the world as it is versus the world as it ought to be. And I'm calling not only you as a community, but I'm calling the nation and the world to achieve this higher level of, of human existence that comes from the, our values and our core. Without the values, you can't articulate the vision. So, there, as we've discussed, there are many different models of leadership, and I'm going to take you through a few of them. The first is the dot in the center. What does it feel like to be the dot in the center? Bad. <laughs> Bad. Okay. Well, it could feel good too. Some people who haven't spoken. Yeah. What does it feel like to be the dot in the center? The center of something. So get attention. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so get, having a lot of attention, being the center of attention. What does it feel like to be the center of attention? Disturbing. Disturbing, okay. <laughs> so, so maybe disturbing for some people. Could it also feel really good for others? Yeah. Right? Okay, and, okay. What does it feel like to be one of these arrows? Have you ever, has anyone ever worked in an organization where a leader was like this? Yes. Yeah, it seems like everyone's reporting to one person. It's like even the small thing, big things. Mm -hmm. Is it sufficient? And effective? Okay. What does it feel like to be this arrow right here? Not even looking quite right at the center. Not even looking at the center. What's that? Insignificant. Insignificant, right? And how does it feel? I mean, you just so insignificant. What else? Have you influential. Been? Not influential. Okay. Good. All right. So, this is the most common model of leadership that I've observed in organizations. And the question is, well, why does this model exist? If this is not effective, if people don't like working in this kind of environment, why does this exist? Why do people continue to practice this model? Because they're happy to be in charge of everything, and then they feel like they're the center. And without yeah. them, uh, especially like I've seen with the uh, older leaders, like who are already like over um, their 60s, they're happy to be still in charge and that everybody needs them and their expertise. Yes. Yes. They cannot deal if they don't hear something. That's, yeah, that's exactly so. So it goes back to the idea of control. Yep. And, and this goes back to your point, which is these people aren't tr trusting others Definitely. and enabling. They're and enabling sarcastic, others. in my opinion. Okay, all right. They have fear. fear. Once again, fear, fear, of, fear of losing what? control. Losing control. <coughs> okay, right. I want to talk about the arrow side. Yeah. Well, some people are maybe feel comfortable being staying in a small arrow because they don't have any responsibility. Okay, all right. There you go. That's, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. So maybe these people have not learned yet to take responsibility as leaders themselves. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so the task, there are many people like that in organizations. The mm -hmm. task of this leader is to enable all of these arrows to take responsibility and to shift the, arrow, the arrow's direction. Mm -hmm. and we'll talk more about that. So here's another model of leadership that exists in, the, in the different organizations. What does this model communicate to you? And what is it like to be in this kind of organization? Some people who haven't spoken. How about, how do you say your name? Yun. Yun. Yes. How, how about Yun? I think it looks more like in a classroom, and I think all the dots are kind of teacher, 
Okay. We kind of passing on something to somebody else. Okay. Okay. And so let let's suppose it's um, an organization, mm -hmm. and and these are many different leaders within an organization, mm -hmm. and they're all going out kind of doing their own thing. What is it like to be in that kind of organization? Is it effective? Is it not effective? Why? I think um, it might be effective for some organization when the um, leaders kind of de decentralize all okay. the responsibility to subordinates or um, co-workers, but I'm not sure about the, the co-workers, are they feel comfortable, maybe because some some of them might feel comfortable to take charge, but some of them might feel they are insecure because they don't know how to act on the, the, the task that they, they, they are asked to be responsible for. Okay, alright, that's good, that's good. So what happens when there's no coordination between this one and that one? This one's going their own way, this one's going their own way. What happens? No cooperation. No cooperation, good. No what communication, else? like how do they communicate no for common goals of the organization? Exactly, good. Well, I would say if they are driven by the sharp common goal, that in this model can make sure that they can reach to the maximum group of people. But if there's no communication, that's bad because everybody will go their own way. That's exactly right, right. So if you go back to our definition of leadership, which is enabling others to achieve shared common purpose, mm -hmm. there's no shared purpose here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone's their own leader, doing their own things. And it's, it's a fragmented organization. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, is, do you have, I'm just curious if you have an example of an organization, even if you can make one up or something. Yeah. Like, what kind of organization uh, has adopted this sort of model? So, um, let's suppose you look at uh, some of these large institutions. And this can happen on a smaller scale as well. This can happen in a campaign. So, campaigns mm -hmm. are about establishing leadership teams across the country. Um, and you've got Tons of leadership teams, not only across the country, but also in, in different regions, in, in different mm -hmm. districts, etc. And if all of the different leadership teams, each dot could represent a team, if, if they don't have a sense of shared purpose, then they're all going to be doing their own thing. And is that going to be effective for the, the larger common goal of what they want to do, which is elect somebody? I mean, that's, that's an example. Another example would be a large um, organization. Let's, let's say Hewlett Packard. They've got thousands of employees in a multi-billion dollar budget. They've got people in Houston, they've got people in Cambridge, they've got people in California, they've got people in India, they've got people all over the world. Let's say this is a team in India, this is a team in Silicon Valley, and this is a team in Cambridge, Massachusetts. If there's no shared purpose there, the organization is just going to be going in multiple different directions. And that's not effective. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I have another example too. Google. You think Google is one thing? Really, they're, they're putting their energy in millions of other things, like Google Maps, Google Video, That's exactly Google, right. Google, whatever you think, Google Calendar, Google, Google Network, Google Plus, Google. Google. What is Google, you know? You think Google was a search engine, that was the power of Google, and they tried to convert everything there, and I don't know where they're going. So exactly what's right. going to be next for Google, you know? Yeah. And they're using this model. And, and this, doesn't, this isn't always the case, but that's why oftentimes uh, Mark Zuckerberg says that uh, Facebook knows that oftentimes they, they will not beat entrepreneurs um, because they're such a large organization. So he says that they want to work with and partner with entrepreneurs. Okay. So, um, so I'll move on here. So this is the, the model of leadership that, that we've been teaching. And again, this stuff comes from Marshall Gans at the Kennedy School. Um, the snowflake model of leadership. It's funny because in the campaign, even in the recent campaign, a lot of my friends who are teaching fellows are were leading different parts of Obama's campaign, and snowflake leadership was a uh, very, very much a common language in the campaign. And so, if you, we go back to our definition: taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. How does this model do that? What does it take to be this kind of leader here? There's delegation approach. You don't deal with everybody, you just deal with like a CEO and vice president. Okay. Everybody has segregation of somebody's responsible of only their field mm -hmm. and they serve for a common purpose, which is the CEO. Okay, okay. All right. What else? So so everybody's connected in a way here. So I think that's the idea of the snow of the snowflake like leadership. That, that, However, 
I would say that the small dots on the outside are the ones that are actually on the ground. Like they are the ones that know what's going on. So I would argue that the people on the outside of it are the ones that should be informing what's going on with the person on the inside. You know, mm -hmm. what's really happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. So so that oftentimes in organizations you'll have the CEO and the vice presidents at the top, and they're they're delegating things that are totally irrelevant to what's happening at the bottom, so to speak. And so th there's another model of leadership that I've got. It's actually not in this, this deck, but um, where it's command and control. But you've got, you've got the line like this, you've got the person at the top, and then you have people coming down like this. So this person is on top. That's a model that could be equated to this model, but it's very different. This is more of a flat model as opposed to a top-down model. So I don't know if you did that on purpose, but it looks like there's arrows going toward it. I don't think you meant to do that. Going toward what? So like the three, like you have one, two, three, and it looks like an arrow pointing towards the center. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I actually never noticed that. Nope, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, and ideally, these, these, these would be teams or individuals, and they would then be enabling others as well, and then they would be enabling others, and it just builds out into a huge snowflake. Yeah. This is what happens in campaigns, and again, this is, this is flat leadership as opposed to top-down. So the vision doesn't necessarily only come from here. The vision is constantly adapting as a result of what's happening here. And also, it's like for me, what it's uh, like also people in charge, like not in the maybe vice president, president, but also people do, doing other things that are in charge of. Exactly. Yes. So, so the idea of taking initiating things. Yes. So people are taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose. Blah 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 blah. People are doing that here, 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 all the way out here. It's not only happening here with the executive team. It happens all throughout the organization. Yes. I feel like you could even have arrows that, or arrows, or lines that connect all of the perimeter as well. Okay, there you go. So like this, that's good. Yeah. That's good. And maybe it actually looked like a snowflake. That's good. I like that. Great. Okay. So um, we talked about, um, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to take you through this. I'll just kind of breeze over it. Um, what is organizing? How do you create change in the world? And this is all relevant to entrepreneurship, etc. The common approach, people say, well, if I only had enough money, then I'd have power, then I could create change. Well, history has proven us, proven to us that it's not merely about money, it's about people. People are power. And when you have lots of people with common vision, they can create change. Gandhi showed us that. King showed us that. Um, Cesar Chavez and the farm workers movement in the United States showed us that. So um, it's really about learning to enable others. Because where does money come from? Money comes from people. Of course you need money, but that's not the angle. There are five questions you can ask in, uh, as you're doing this. First is, and this, there's a lot, we need to spend a lot more time on this, but we're, I'm going to breeze over it. Um, who is the constituency? Who are the people who are affected by the problem? And how can you mobilize those people to become the author of their own change? Um, that's, that's the goal as a leader, is to go into a community and to enable the people who are affected by the problem to overcome their own problem, rather than solving it for them. Um, what do the constituency want? What kind of motivating vision in the world are they trying to achieve? Who holds the resources needed to address what the constituency wants? Oftentimes, it's people who are in power, corrupt leaders, corrupt business people, etc. So how can you enable people to overcome these kinds of challenges? Well, mobilizing them to achieve shared purpose will create the change we need. What are the interests of the, of the actors who hold the resources and the power? Oftentimes they want control and they want to continue to hold the resources that they have. What resources do the constituency hold, uh, which the other actors require to address the interests? So if you look at the Montgomery bus boycott, the bus system was segregated. Okay? The bus system was a microcosm of, of the broader society. So you had uh, a bus driver in the front. He was deputized. He had a gun. Whites in the front blacks in the back, and the, and the, the African-American community in the United States wanted to change this, um, not only in Montgomery, Alabama, but across the world. And so they thought if we can do it in one specific place, with one specific instance, maybe that will create a broader change. So they focus on Montgomery, Alabama, on the bus system. If you look at the bus leaders, what did the bus leaders want? What did the bus leaders want? The owners bus owners and the politicians. Change. Direction. Oh. Did they want change though? <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you're a bus leader and 
and the policy lead, uh, leaders are telling you, okay, you know, this is just how it's been. You're making money off of this. Do you want changes as the owner of the bus system? I mean, wh what are you really interested in as the uh, owner of the bus system? Making money. You, money. you want to make some money, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens if everyone who uses your bus takes away what you want, which is money? What are you going to do? Fight. Fight? Okay, fight. And what if, what, if, what if fighting doesn't get you the money you want? What are you going to do? Then change the business. Change the business. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, right? And that's exactly what happened. So the African-American community, it was an amazing sight. I mean, obviously I wasn't there, but I've seen pictures where people, uh, the bus system was, was just totally empty. And the African-American community organized there a very intricate wow. system of, wow. of mobilizing wow. people. And you had, you had pastors who were working full-time, <coughs> bringing uh, uh, as chauffeurs around the, around the city. They had organized stops, <coughs> and people were walking. And, and as they were walking, they were singing their African-American hymns and... I mean, just a beautiful sight. They organized the masses to circumvent the bus system. And here, here, here everyone was, going to work, going to school, doing what they normally did, and the buses were driving around the city empty. And the bus system had to change. And so they, the, they, the bus system finally integrated. And when they integrated, um, that was a huge victory for the African-American community in, in the South, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. So if you can ena enable... If you just enabled a few people to do that, that wouldn't have changed things. They enabled lots of people to achieve shared purpose um, under conditions, massive conditions of uncertainty. Um, and there's a lot of violence as a result. But the one thing I think is profound and, and, and that enables Martin Luther King and others to, to go down in history is the fact that as they created this massive change in society, they did not, con their actions did not conflict with their values and their beliefs. They said, we will stand up for what we believe in, but we will never hurt you or harm you. We won't use violence. And that's why I think it was such a profound thing, and that's why we're, we're still talking about it today. You can create change while not, while not compromising your values. You go down in history. And that's what Martin Luther King has proven, as well as Gandhi. Uh, to summarize... This is a broad overview of, of the curriculum that uh, is taught at Harvard and that uh, one of the pieces that we teach at Cornerstone. Um, and this comes from Marshall Gans' curriculum. Uh, what is a disorganization? A disorganization, whether it's a campaign, whether it's a company, whether it's a nonprofit organization, whether it's an academic institution, whether it's a, a team leading a, a series of workshops like this. That could be a, an organization or a disorganization. And disorganization is, is passive, it's divided, it's marked by drift, it's reactive, and it, it doesn't really do much. An organization, on the other hand, is, is active, it's united, it has a sense of shared purpose, creates initiative in the world, and it actually creates change. To move from a disorganization to an organization, we need leadership. To move from passive to active, we need shared story. And as I mentioned, the shared story is a story of self. Who am I as a leader? A story of us, who are my people? A story of now, given who I am and who we are and what our values are. What are we called to do now, together, to achieve change in the world? So shared story. Ultimately, people, at the end of the day, are motivi motivated by values. So if you can give people an opportunity to translate their values into action, in a common goal, toward a common goal, that's when people are going to be motivated to work with you, and we communicate our, our, our values by sharing stories. So sharing, all of these things are things that, that we do naturally and instinctually as, as human beings. We share stories. All cultures do that. To move from divided to united, we need relational commitment. And the glue, the glue of relationships is commitment. And when people are committed, um, they're committed because they're in a community that shares their values. If you're in a community that doesn't share your values, you're not going to be as inclined to, to commit to that community. So you need a relational commitment. Move from drift to purpose, there needs to be structure. So let's suppose you, you go out and you're recruiting a team of people, regardless of what you're recruiting them for. You share your story. You learn their story. You articulate a, a motivating vision of what we want the world to be like. And we build commitment and relationships. And let's say after you build lots of relationships, and let's say you get 20 people who want to, want to join what you're doing, how do you structure those relationships in such a way that you can achieve shared purpose? 
Well, this ultimately goes into teams. There's a whole framework around all these leader leadership practices. Uh, clear structure is learning to create teams that are bounded, stable, diverse, interdependent, and that have clear norms, clear roles, and clear clear responsibilities, and a clear sense of shared purpose. And teams ultimately uh, build capacity, create a culture of learning, and uh, and what's the other one? Build capacity, create a culture of learning, and, and accomplish goals. Um, I, again, for the sake of time, we can't go into the specifics of that. Uh, moving from being reactive to creating initiative, uh, we need creative strategy. So once you actually have your teams, you have relational commitment, you have values, uh, then we can come together and we can strategize together. And once we strategize together, then we can actually engage in effective action that has concrete, measurable outcomes and goals. So this is an entire curriculum uh, that's taught over the course of the semester at the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as in workshops literally, literally around the world. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that's being taught to Camp Obama as well, to mobilize uh, the snowflake. And, uh, and there, there's a lot more, but uh, I'm pretty much, how am I doing on time here? Uh, it's already yeah. passed. Already passed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, thank you for the privilege to be here. It's good to chat with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I guess I know you know you have lots of questions for him, and if you actually could let us know your email address, sure. I think they can you know yeah. email you. Sure. That would be actually great. So we're gonna take um, intermission time for about like seven minutes. Sorry about that. <laughs> short. But um, uh, and then we have a feedback form that's to some before you leave. It's about the first and second session, this one. So I will distribute that during intermission. So, okay. <laughs> See you soon. All right.